<laughs> at this point, whatever Her happens, happens. <laughs> oh, I think we are live, actually. Uh, yes, uh, hi all. Uh, welcome uh, back. I hope everyone can see us and hear us. Please say hello in the chat box. Uh, because I think we had slight technical difficulties before, but uh, actually, uh, you know, we are, we are here, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our last Health Foundation representatives. Uh, so this Friday, we have Fiona Green uh, uh, from Health Foundation. She's data analyst, and she has a background in biochemistry, which is I, which I found absolutely fascinating. And we also have Emma Westerson, um, who is also analyst in the uh, Health Foundation, and. Uh, Emma has background in math and economics, so I always believe that diversity in backgrounds is what, what brings success to any project. So let's hear then from them uh, about their response to COVID and how Health Foundation opened up their analytics. Um, over to you, Fiona and Emma. Thank you, and thanks so much for having us. I'm uh, really excited to tell you a little bit about how we used R and open analytics in our response to COVID. Um, I'm just going to try and share the slides now. Emma, give me a shout once you can see something. I can see them. All right. And now I can see them in full. Perfect. OK, ready to go. So just for uh, some very brief introductions, my name is Fiona. I'm here with my colleague, Emma. We are both analysts at the Health Foundation. Um, we work in the data analytics team. Um, and you will have already heard this if you went to Adam's or Ellen's talk earlier this week. Um, so our aim in data analytics is to ensure um, that data, the data analytics has a positive impact on um, the UK's health. Um, and we were working towards a vision where everyone's health and care benefits from analytics and data driven technology. And there are four ways in which we are trying to make this happen. Um, that's by uh, doing really good analytics, um, tackling some of the big issues in health and care. Um, we also want to provide um, an independent voice uh, around policy and system change. We want to support better analytical uh, capability in the system itself. And we want to build partnerships, uh, initiatives and uh, support communities such as the NHSR community. Um, we are quite a large team. I think there's around 26 of us. Um, and so before COVID started, our work um, covered a really broad range of topics. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what I mean with that, and so some people were working on evaluations of complex changes to the healthcare system, for example, integrated care or digital first primary care. We also had a, a really big focus on multimorbidity. Um, we were working on international comparisons, um, projects around mental health. The Network Data Lab was just getting started. And we also had a big focus on how we do analytics and how we could, for example, develop better data pipelines. And then March 2020 happened. And suddenly, we were all working remotely, just like I'm sure everyone else was. Um, and one of the first things that we had to figure out was how to securely um, access our data from home. Uh, and our data management and IT teams did an amazing job of making that happen really, really quickly so that we could continue our work. But we also realized that the national priorities had completely changed and people wouldn't have the time or headspace to, to um, take in analysis on topics that wasn't re related to COVID at the moment. We also got quite a lot of urgent requests for analysis around COVID. So it was pretty clear that we needed to adapt our analytical program. And there is um, several several ways in which we did that. So we, we quickly realized that we had to pause some of the projects because we wouldn't have capacity to take everything forward alongside work and COVID. Um, and that enabled us to continue ongoing work and at the same time to um, establish a COVID working group. And that was a cross-functional team that had both analysts, data managers, people who were really good at writing and decision makers so that we could we had all the functionality within that team to really quickly turn around analytical projects um, around COVID. Um, and if I make this sound really easy, it wasn't. It was a really big shift for us. Um, but we're quite proud of what we managed to achieve within just a few months of work. And here I'm just showing you some examples of the media coverage that our analysis received. Um, for example, the uh, our analysis of the uh, weekly ONS death statistics got a really good response, um, as did our um, 
our analysis on regional variation in how care homes were affected. Um, and here on the right side, I'm showing some of the more in-depth work we did on adult social care and the impact that COVID-19 had. So we had previously made a commitment that we wanted to work as openly and as transparently as possible. Um, and throughout all of this, we wanted to stick to that um, and to really champion good analytical practice, but to also experiment and test new ways of working to push ourselves and how we can become even more open and develop better tools and resources that other people can use and to share our learning whenever we get the, the opportunity to do so. Um, so for the next part, I'm gonna hand over to Emma who will be talking about how we used R and Open Analytics um, during the, for this program of work and some of the challenges that we came across along the way as well. Thanks Fiona and hi everyone. So I'm going to focus on three main areas and the first one will be the workflow um, idea. So health data is often really messy uh, and we decided to use one type of workflow to approach every new data set. We went for quite a basic one. So we want to access some data, we want to clean it, we want to analyse it and then we want to share the insights from this data. And when we started working with this workflow, I think there were a few things that happened. So first of all, there's this instinct from people to go, well, I'm just going to do this one thing by hand. So that might be deleting a column or deleting some weird character somewhere. But after about eight years as an analyst, I can tell you it's never just one time. Uh, and once you start doing this, there's no record of what was done. So we were really trying to kind of push back on doing these kind of things and instead just documenting and doing everything in an automatic way. Um, we also realise that switching between tools is really risky, so it takes time and uses up quite a lot of mental energy, uh, but it's also error prone and hard to track and reproduce. Um, so we implemented everything in one tool and we found that having that workflow with one tool really paid off and for us that tool was R. Um, so once you have a workflow, you essentially have a bunch of different building blocks that you can use to um, approach new data sets really quickly um, because you can grab code from different projects and use the cleaning function from one in a different one. Uh, you can also rerun analysis really quickly when new data is released once you've removed pretty much all the manual steps. So at one point we have been working on a report for I think about five or six weeks and ONS did a really uh, kind of unexpected data release. Uh, right before the report was going out uh, for kind of final review. But because we had this workflow set up, we were able to rerun all of the analysis and reproduce the charts and the numbers in probably less than an hour. And this meant that the report went out with the most recent data and stayed relevant. So it really, really saved us that we'd put in this effort beforehand. So I also want to focus on, I think, a step that is probably the least kind of well documented normally, and that is how you access the data. Um, so we used to just go to the website and click download, um, but that's actually not a very reproducible way of doing it. So instead we decided to let R just do all the work for us. And there are a few different ways to do this. So you can do it using base R, um, or you can do it using this package that we called curl that we quite like. And essentially once you have the URL for the data, you can download any file using these types of functions. We also built our own package that we called Monster, which stands for Making ONS Tables Readable. And it's got this very cute hex sticker that Fiona designed. And what it does is that it lets you query the ONS API and download di data directly in R. And it means that the data set you get is a lot tidier than what you would get if you downloaded the spreadsheets that are more designed for people than for uh, computers. So the other big thing that Fiona has already touched on was uh, the remote working and how to collaborate when you're working remotely. So this used to be all of us. We were all a happy bunch of analysts working around one laptop, sharing ideas and talking through code. Uh, and then COVID hit the dreaded March 2020 and everything now happened online and over Zoom calls. Uh, and there were quite a few things that are harder to do remotely. First of all, Communicate, communicating analytical details when you are online is really hard because you can't just point to your screen 
or kind of use your hands to describe things. Um, the other thing is it's really hard to debug code uh, when you're working from an empty office at home. Uh, and in the office, I used to be able to just go over to Fiona and say, I'm having this issue, can you help me? And by talking it through, we would solve our problems. Now there's quite a big barrier because you have to send an instant message um, and try to talk to people over the phone. So this was a lot harder. You also miss out on all of the informal conversations that would happen in an office. And this means that you're not keeping up with people's progress as well. Uh, so you, you're at risk of duplicating work or working on the wrong version of something. So our approach to this was to use GitHub to solve not all but many of these problems. So what we liked about using GitHub is that it gives you a plan and a permanent record of all the decisions and issues linked to an analysis. And we took the approach of putting our projects on GitHub pretty much from the first line of code. Um, so this also meant that if you need to hand over the analysis, all the code was online, someone could take over really quickly. It reduced analytical waste because these kind of building blocks that I was talking about earlier, you could just go to a different repo if you knew that someone was working on something and grab that code. It makes it really easy to keep up with um, what other people are doing because especially if you're nosy, so you can just go and look at, okay, this project was updated yesterday. This is what they're working on at the moment. We also think that it makes you write better code and that's because you're forced to document things in a way that you wouldn't if it's just hidden away in a folder on your laptop. Um, and it means that you remove that commented code that probably shouldn't be there and you add another comment just to make things clearer. A slightly unexpected benefit of using GitHub is that it's a lot easier to credit contributions. Um, so unlike when you're writing a report or a paper, you can credit anyone who's done anything on your project. So this is a screenshot from the monster package where you can see all the contributors and some people have kind of pointed out typos and some people have written 95% of the code, but we can credit all of them, which we think is really nice. Um, we have a few people from the NGSR community who have contributed, which was also really, really nice to see. So I've talked a lot about happy things. I will say that once you put everything online, you do need to factor in the time to keep all your repos up to date and respond to queries and issues. And that can be um, that can be tricky. So we use GitHub for more than just collaboration. So when you're an analyst, I mean, we've all been doing this. We love talking about code. We love talking about data and methods. Uh, but we work for a policy organization or focus organization so there's not always space to talk about the details in our policy briefings so to solve this problem we used github pages to publish extra information about what we had done and it's really easy so if you know how to use our markdown you can knit to html and then you publish that as a github page and it essentially creates a mini website where you can have this extra analysis and obviously you can share the code and everything so we used GitHub pages for one more thing, and that was to build a website for our monster package. So we used a package down package to actually build the website. And then we used, they used this package to set up a workflow with GitHub Actions uh, to give us this website that updates anytime the package itself is updated. Um, and this whole process took about, I think, between 15 and 30 minutes to set up. It was really easy and it gives you quite a, I think, professional looking website to go with your package. So that was the last point, but I do wanna share some of the things that we've learned in more broader terms. So the main thing is that you want to build skills and adopt new tools before you need them urgently. It's really hard to expect you can't just learn things in the middle of a pandemic. It's really, really hard. Uh, and also, if you're working at pace and scale, that requires everyone to be comfortable with the tools that you use. And for us, it really helped having a shared language of R. And we also did quite a lot of training during COVID. And it's been really nice to see everyone attend the workshops during this conference. And finally, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So even a tiny bit of standardization goes a really long way in making your life easier. And it be, might be that this time you 
um, automate the setup of folders and have an agreed folder structure. And for your next analysis, you take it one step further, but you just need to get started. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Fiona again. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Emma. Um, so um, we, so I can hear myself now. Um, so we talked a lot about the tools that we found useful during this time um, and, and how they helped us. But we also want to acknowledge that it is, it's about more than just tools and open working requires a lot more than that. Um, and that we think it's really, it, it is so important to have the support from your organization and to also have the time and space for training and to become comfortable with these tools because it is a daunting thing to do at first, but all your code online from, from the get go and um, feeling comfortable with the kind of tools that you use helps analysts to feel safe sharing and to, um, to know that you can try things out and maybe also get things wrong. Um, we also think that the extra work at the beginning needs to be valued. Everything takes longer when you do it the first time, and that is just something that needs to be factored in. Um, and all of these things might require a little bit of a culture change. For us, community really, really helps um, because just knowing that there are other per people working in the same way, struggling with the same issues potentially, it's just really motivating. It helps build momentum. And I mean, as this week has shown, it's just great to be able to learn from each other as well. We've mostly been talking about sharing code now, but something that we want to briefly touch on is um, sharing data, because we think there's a lot that can still be improved. Um, when organizations share data, they generally want other people to use this data, but we can we can do a few really easy things that, that makes it easier for other people. Um, just such as, such as um, sharing things in a machine readable format in a fixed location, ideally with a clear version history in a consistent format and to also signpost, re signpost resources really well, um, during, especially during a time like this when ch things change incredibly quickly. And we just wanted to point out um, a blog written by our colleague Karen um, that we really like about how to be a better collaborator in a time of crisis. There's also a lot of other work, good work out there um, that we think you should check out. For example, the ODI, ODI leads have some really interesting uh, open data tips. And we also really love the, um, the book produced by the Turing Way on how to do um, open data science. So with that, the only thing left to do is to uh, say thank you to all the amazing people that we have been working with on this. Um, we've also put together some links at the end if uh, that might be helpful for uh, people to get started. And we think the slides will be shared so you'll be able to, to use all these links. Uh, so if there's still time, we'd be very happy to take any questions. Um, Emma and Fiona, thank you so much. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkably uh, rare thing, really, that um, the funder of an award is actually swimming in the same waters as the the, the, the award holders themselves really so to have to have a, uh, you working in data science and, and and hearing about your journey and your progress is actually very heartening because it it kind of gives us reassurance as well that that we've got kind of alignment at a, at a bigger level but also to recognize that um you know your your progress is also something that that uh, we can benefit from and, and vice versa so look a big a big thank you to to all of you um I've, there are some questions on the um uh, on the chat so if i can just i'll take them in the order they've appeared uh, as per the vote so some uh, people love your monster r hex sticker they want some <laughs> so we it's... haven't had any printed yet but i think oh. we will try to as soon as we will be able to actually hand them out, I think we should definitely get some printed. All right. Okay. Great. Well, p perhaps if you if if you I mean I mean if you send them to, to us centrally, we can we can uh, and then people can ask uh, ask from there. Or one of the things we need to think about is having a digital repository of um, of uh, these hex stickers so people can download and because uh, anyways we can think about that. Uh, another question is. Um, have you written any standard operating procedures around Git for your team? No, I think that is something we want to do. So we've done pretty much everyone in our team has now gone through, through a one day training course on using Git. Um, but we need to kind of write up our own procedures around how we do it. Um, 
What we have done is create some templates at least for how we think, what we think a Git repository should look like. What, when you start, um, we have some templates for readmes and that's been really useful. Um, but uh, yeah, we find it surprisingly challenging to, to document a workflow in words. Um, and I think at, at the moment it's mostly communicated between colleagues, but um, it's something that we really need to get going with. Well, I mean, even even the templates you describe, I think, seems like a very important step forward. If um, if these are not if these are something you're willing to share, perhaps just let us know because I'm sure there'll be uh, other people interested in in more and more remote working, but but as a team and kind of what are the steps they might want to they might want to take. Uh, a couple of other questions, um, just a question uh, on this notion of security and GitHub, is that something that uh, you, you've had a chance to think about or has it cropped up in conversations? It has, so this is um, one of the blogs that we reference at the end of our slides actually goes into this a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, when we started sharing code on GitHub, we sort of thought through the risks and the steps that we can take to make sure that um, that everything we we share goes through the right disclosure control processes. So, um, because a lot of the work we do is using se sensitive patient data. Um, so essentially our code goes through exactly the same disclosure control processes as our statistical results would do. Um, right. And we have some right. rules that we stick to. For example, we never, we never add any comments that contain data or statistical results. Um, and it's just a habit that we have to get rid of very quickly. And once you stick to these, it's actually very easy to to check for um, disclosive comments and to then release it and put it on our public GitHub um, uh, repository. Yeah. But but I think, as you said, it's very helpful to have some principles and rules that you stick to. Okay, but that 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 is very reassuring, though. That that uh, with a bit of kind of self discipline, we, we can keep well away from some of the kind of really tricky uh, tricky things uh, and uh, it just means that it's uh, it's not as a big a first step as we think really uh, and often with open source tools people use security as a as a as a way not to, as a reason for not trying to move forward really rather than a a thing to kind of uh, address it's often used as a thing to just block the conversation uh, great and then just one other question has been um because you've been using it from your work laptops uh, uh at at home or your work pc at home and so on did you have any kind of issues because it's a work laptop um so i think I know that some people won't have Git installed on their laptops, I think especially NHS laptops. Um, I think actually one of the advantages is that you can, I ended up being stranded without a work laptop, so because we had things on GitHub, I could do things that didn't have sensitive data on my own laptop. But I think we don't, we have special environments where we work with data. So it hasn't actually been that big an issue, um, but I, I think it would be for for some people. Yeah, that might be something again that colleagues on the call uh, on the kind of conference can can start to think about. Really, is how we make uh, uh, kind of access to these tools um, uh, appropriately through through uh, um, information kind of uh, uh, environments uh, in in NHS organisations. Okay, great. Look, it's it's about a minute to go. So thank you both of you again for a. For a lovely talk really and one that kind of gives us a lot of kind of uh, sense of how we might start to work uh, more collaboratively in the in the future i'm sure there'll be requests for for more more um, uh, uh, kind of uh, dual presentations from the both of you so thank you both very much indeed <laughs> thank you great we'll see you yeah. the next session folks bye <laughs>